The desire to see what the future holds is as old as human imagination. From the oracles of ancient Greece to the latest supercomputer, we have always wanted to see ahead, to know what is coming, and to prepare for it. This desire matters more than ever because the future has never been more important. The life of Earth's biosphere is hanging in the balance. The crisis that we're facing in this century is really complex because we think long-term, if the long-term problem won't hit us for 40 years, well, we can wait 38 before we fix it. But that's not the way the world works. Most scientists fear that by 2100, a warming planet will have unleashed an environmental catastrophe. If this happens, our species will face the most serious threat to its survival since we walked out of Africa 60,000 years ago. No generation in the past has ever had such a responsibility towards the future as this one does. Uh, we are balanced on the edge of a knife. We could go either way into ecological, economic, and species catastrophe, or we could build the future that we've always dreamed of. The good news is, the solutions to the problems we face may already be here. But are we ready? In the coming few decades, human beings will face a stark choice between action and inaction. The future is coming, and the question is, are we going to help build that future or become its victim? There's something about the future that frightens people because it is something that is not yet, and it is therefore sheer possibility. And that means that there is the freedom to make of it what we will. It also is somewhat dreadful because it puts a huge responsibility on us for the outcomes of our actions. But control over our future is slipping away. Our partner in life, the planet Earth, is in deep trouble, and the crisis threatens to destroy the world we know. Can anyone say that our high-tech civilization is going to be around 6,000 years from now, 1,000 years from now, 100 years from now? I think the next 20 years will probably decide whether we come up with a solution or we'll just let things slide into a world that's tremendously impoverished compared to the one that we grew up in. We all seem to understand the challenges we face and that we are going to have to change the way we live. The question is, will we do it? Can we do it? I think our culture has this double think about this apocalyptic end to the world. Because we haven't experienced anything on that scale, and because it's almost like it's a disaster movie, that it's hard to construct a personal feeling, a personal sense of what that would mean for me. Yes, I can imagine exactly what happens to the planet when things fall apart and the center no longer holds, but I can't imagine what happens to me, what happens to my life. And yet, many of us have never been more hopeful about our lives. We are living longer, we are healthier, and we are striving towards an imagined golden age of prolonged youth and vitality. And our technology is helping us get there. The lab of Dr. Anthony Atala is the largest in the world devoted to a growing field of biotechnology, regenerative medicine. The goal of regenerative medicine is simple yet radical to grow and replace aging human organs and tissues. Regenerative medicine actually is a field which uses your body's own ability to regenerate to create new tissues and organs. The whole concept is actually that if a patient requires a tissue or organ, you would take a small piece of tissue from that patient 
grow those cells outside the body, create the structure, and put it right back into the same patient, and therefore you avoid any type of rejection. In 2006, Dr. Atala made headlines around the world when he successfully grew seven human bladders in the lab and implanted them in patients. Innovation is often focused on our desires. We want innovation that will improve health, that will improve the quality of life, that will improve uh, life expectancy. So life and health, are, I think, are pretty constant determinants of what we're trying to achieve. In this process, the patient's cells are cultured and then seeded on a biodegradable organ-shaped scaffold. These new cells contain all the genetic information necessary to make new tissue. Eight weeks later, they have grown into a functioning organ. Once we started working on one specific organ, and we started looking at things such as muscle, cartilage, blood vessels, bone, things that really create the basic building blocks for most tissues and organs in the body. The lab is now working on regrowing more than 20 tissues and organs. And the research has unleashed a transformation in the way we think about the health of our aging bodies. If something goes wrong, then we're going to go ahead and try to, to make you better. But it's not really to build a superhuman. It's really just to restore you to where you were before. One of the ideas that I think we need as humans to take very seriously is the idea that we can replace evolution with a more deliberately chosen process. We are vulnerable to disease, to injury. We are vulnerable to pain and distress of all sorts. If we can improve on those sorts of vulnerabilities, we surely should. The ability to regrow parts of the human body has also captured the attention of corporate America as investment capital pours into the commercialization and mass production of custom-made body parts. There are big hopes for regenerative medicine. If that promise is fulfilled, and it does look very promising, then that will be a huge leap forward in terms of enhancement and in terms of making us generally healthier and longer lived. These dreams represent a profoundly optimistic view of our bodies. Once, not too long ago, we felt this way about the world itself. There's a vision of the future that says that whatever comes in the future has to be better. And I think that in many respects, our modern Western civilization has been built on that model of thinking, that going forward is always going to a better place. The future is supposed to be not just a better place, but a bigger and richer place. The ideology of economics is one of continual growth. For the most part, the desirability of growth is unquestioned, like the existence of God used to be during the age of faith, that growth is in and of itself a good thing. The 20th century was defined by the gospel of ever-expanding technological innovation. A new world is constantly opening before us at an ever-accelerating rate of progress. A greater world, a better world, a world which always will grow forward. There was this incredible technological positivism, the sense that technology will let us do anything. It was an attitude shaped by the pop culture fantasies of pulp magazines and science fiction. Our visions of the future are always more dramatic than reality. Alfred Hitchcock once said movies were life with the dull parts edited out. Most forecasts are life in the future with the dull parts edited out. Yeah. 
those marvelous visions we got were arguments in favor of particular kinds of outcomes. A world of personal robots, a world of flying cars, a world of rocket ships that have pointy tips and are very romantic. So what happened? Why didn't that future ever arrive? Lots of those futures could have easily happened. What we do is inventors propose and society disposes. The engineers throw innovations and ideas out there and society decides whether it wants them or not. And most of what inventors proposed is thrown away. That's why we don't have quadraphonic stereo. That's why nobody uses CB radio. It's why there's not a flying car in your driveway. So there you have what many experts say is the train of the future, the monorail ride. For all the predictions that didn't come true, there was one big one that did, and it changed our world forever. Imagine, if you can, an electronic brain operating at millionth of a second speed. I say brain because the new electronic central office will almost think for itself. Computers were part of a technology-driven future where man was the master of the universe. The 50s and the 60s were part of a vision of utopia that we could control the world, that technology was going to help us control the world, and that we were in a position of power vis-a-vis -vis the planet. Computers greatly accelerated human progress, allowing us to solve, in hours, technical and scientific problems that used to take years. They allowed us to look into the future, predicting military outcomes, the weather, election results, and changes in the economy. The eureka moment for forecasting came when computers were uh, getting powerful enough that they could uh, handle you know, these kind of complex computations. You know, in the 1950s and even in the 1960s, there was really great optimism that we would be able to predict the future quite far in advance. Their optimism was based on the idea that forecasting is basically just a question of, you know, reducing things to its simple parts, figuring out the fundamental laws, and then solving these equations. All the problem that's left over is the computing side. So all you need is a bigger computer. Computers allowed us to believe that there was nothing humanity could not achieve. The flight was simulated from an adjacent room in the Mission Control Center, Houston. And like many other things in the space age, flight simulation is done by computers. By the late 1960s, computers were guiding a lunar capsule to the moon. The Apollo program was the high watermark of the high-tech dreams of the 20th century. The future, it seemed, had truly arrived. But a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. From 380,000 kilometers away, we saw our planet and ourselves for the very first time. The most interesting thing about the moon missions was when they looked in the rearview mirror and they saw the planet Earth for the first time against the emptiness of all space. You know, it was like we suddenly realized that actually the Earth was a very special system. In a sense, it was kind of alive. The image of the Earth from space was a moment of revelation. For the first time, we recognized that humanity's future and the future of the planet were one and the same. And for the first time, we began to recognize that planet had a very big problem. Us. In the heady decades following the invention of the computer, we believed it was a servant to our endless progress. But that's not what happened because the computer started to bring us bad news. Three years after the moon landing, the world was introduced to a new phrase, the limits to growth. Computer models were now showing that the human species was rapidly using up the resources on the planet and was on a reckless path to extinction. 
when they came out with this document in the early 70s, I think people were very persuaded, first of all, because it was a group of experts who were making these predictions, and second of all, the computers said it was so. I think that there was more faith at that time in the truth value of computer projections, of computer simulations. But this radical idea provoked an immediate backlash at the highest level. We believed then and now there are no limits to growth and human progress when men and women are free to follow their dreams. And we were right. Despite the conviction, the larger issue is our inability to confront the long-term consequences of our actions. Society as a whole has a very short horizon in terms of looking at the future. Companies look at the next quarter. Even long-term investments, a long-term investment might be 10, 15 years. The human brain evolved very nicely to deal with near-term predictions, near-term projections of possibilities. But the problem is the challenges that we're facing now don't fit into that near-term prediction uh, structure. There are much longer-term problems, long lag problems, that our brain simply isn't very good at dealing with. We're really good at dealing with short-term projections. You know, is there a saber-toothed tiger around the corner kind of thing? Since the 1980s, the predictions have only become more ominous, and there is growing evidence that the initial forecasts were largely accurate. Today's supercomputers are 500,000 times more powerful than the computers that predicted the limits to growth. What that lets us do is to run ever larger simulations with higher and higher resolution is often the way we talk about it in looking at the world whether that means a higher resolution telescope, a higher resolution microscope, uh, or just that we've got way more data coming. The new frontier in supercomputing is called predictive simulation. We think we're on a cusp of another revolution in science through predictive simulation as an extension to the human mind, similar to this telescope being an extension of the human eye. Supercomputers predict the behavior of the world's most complex phenomena in a virtual environment. From understanding the problem of deteriorating nuclear weapon stockpiles to predicting climate change over hundreds of years. Something like a climate model is a very, very difficult thing to do. And if you want to make it really, really accurate, you need to take into account practically everything that goes on on the Earth. As a human race, we have to ask ourselves some pretty fundamental questions, like can we contain carbon and not have the polar ice caps melt? You know, that's a, that's a pretty big question that we need to answer. And it used to be that we'd just go out and do the experiment, but you know, if you're talking about nuclear weapons or swine flu or something like that, you don't want to do the experiment. You'd rather have the answer from a virtual environment. Supercomputers all over the world are producing ever more detailed models of a coming ecological catastrophe. The details vary, but the message is the same. There's huge controversy over whether the climate change models we have today are accurately predicting the future. Now, for all practical matters, you know, <laughs> they, they all agree on one thing, we're in trouble. We have now had decades of evidence gathered by the most advanced computers. For the vast majority of scientists, it is now an article of faith that rising global temperature is reaching the level of a planetary emergency. Arable land, drinkable water, and available energy are expected to be in increasingly short supply. There is widespread fear that this century will see the extinction of half of all species. Yet, the worse the future sounds, the less people seem convinced. A lot of people simply don't believe that the changes that are being described are actually happening. It's extremely difficult to imagine what the world is like elsewhere when it's 30 below and blizzarding outside. Uh, uh, my inclination at, at, on days like that is to cheer for global warming because at least it, <laughs> it might go up a couple of degrees, but in fact, we are 
evolved to only experience what's in front of us. That's fundamentally where our belief about the health of the world comes from, from our direct physical experience of the environment that we're in. But some scientists are well aware of what is at stake. At the beginning of the 21st century, the new futurism is all about survival. And one of the main challenges facing the planet is how to feed the estimated 9 billion people that will call the Earth home by 2050. Each year, approximately 50 billion animals are killed for food, and the number is expected to double by 2020 as meat consumption increases in the developing world. For most of us, the consumption of meat is an essential part of how we live. We do have thousands of years of, of history of being accustomed to eating meat. You know, arguments back and forth about how biologically necessary it is, the fact is it's culturally very important. The problem is, the factory farming of animals is now one of the biggest environmental threats to the planet. It's very clear that this kind of food production system is environmentally, economically, and socially unsustainable. That we simply will not have the same model of food production in 50 years that we have today, no matter what. The crisis has led a growing number of researchers to believe that the future lies in trying to grow meat from stem cells. One of the duties as a scientist is to think about the future and think about how we can improve the future. And if we have the idea that the future is going really bad and, and planet Earth is changing in a negative way, we have to do something about it. So the idea is making meat without having to kill animals. In order for the process to work, the harvested stem cells will first be placed in a nutrient-rich medium to multiply. They will then be attached to a scaffolding structure and put in a bioreactor to grow. To achieve the texture of natural muscle, they must be physically stretched or exercised. In a couple of weeks, you have a thin layer of muscle tissue. The trick is to get this thin layer into something with bulk. So I would think that the first product that would be made from cultured meat will not be a three-dimensional structure, but would be much more a processed product, just like a sausage is not the shape of a muscle, but it is minced meat put into the shape of a sausage. Bernard Roland's dream of growing meat without animals remains years away. Many people never thought about that. But when it gets going and there is indeed something in the supermarket as cultured meat, people might think, wow, we were, we were so uh, old-fashioned to grow animals, to keep animals, and then kill the animals for, for food production. Like many future visions, the dream of lab-grown meat might be ignoring one important thing, human nature. People aren't going to transform to new technology simply because it's, it's a nice thing to do. Gradual incremental change, we can deal with. But fundamental changes like that is much harder to sell. Inertia is one of the problems. We, inertia, you might think of as one of the biggest forces in human affairs. We're very reluctant to change things. We like familiarity, and that tends to be familiarity with disastrous ways of living and disastrous ways of behaving. But humans can and do change, largely through the art of persuasion, otherwise known as hype. Hype around new innovations and technologies is not a bug, it's a feature. Because the simple fact is, as fascinated as we are about the future, and as fascinated as we are about the prospect of change, we actually hate change. And hype is the thing that causes us to dissolve our resistance to change. Did you really wake up one morning before the iPod was invented and say, my life is incomplete without an MP3 player? That old saying, necessity is the mother of invention, 
I'm tempted to say it's more invention is the mother of necessity. The power to create the future is made possible by big advertising and big marketing. In 2011, the world's biggest corporations will spend $1.2 trillion developing the next big thing. All acceptance of new technologies comes from desire. It's anticipation, not satisfaction. And in fact, no entirely new product ever succeeds in the consumer marketplace without first offering the prospect of a life-changing experience. At the moment, the next big thing is often the next green thing, as corporations try to get out in front of the ecological crisis. They know that the end of oil is coming. So just from a pragmatic point of view, they, they know that they have to start addressing the future soon. But can we really have it both ways? Can we improve the bottom line and save the planet? In 2011, Ailing General Motors, one of the world's largest and oldest corporations, will release its vision of a greener future, the Volt. What kind of a vehicle could we create that would just be like, wow, you know, how could we roll together the environment and global warming, sustainable mobility, you know, the whole thing. It makes a statement, hey, look at me. You know, I am something very special. And therefore, the driver can feel very special in driving it. General Motors has been down this road before. 14 years ago, they unveiled the EV1, the first mass-produced electric vehicle. It touched a nerve in people who wanted a new kind of automobile. You know, we've been selling Chevrolets and so forth for a long time. We knew that customer, but inside that customer was another customer, just another emerging psychology, and we really didn't understand that. The problem was there weren't enough of them, and GM wasn't willing to wait for the electric car to catch on. For a management hooked on trucks and SUVs, the EV1 represented a future they didn't want, and they killed the project. The mantra in the business community is always now, show me the business case. What is the business case for environmental responsibility? What is the business case for social responsibility? What is the business case for climate change? 10 years later, GM has emerged from bankruptcy, embracing the same vision of the future they once rejected. This time, the stakes are much higher. This time we have an audience. This time it's very clear in the public's mind that there is a thing called global warming. The marketing challenge is to create a seductive image of a greener future, but one that doesn't threaten the comfortable reality of the present. The challenge for companies is to make more sustainable consumption exciting and sexy and glamorous and wonderful and not like we're giving up things. Because if we have to make sacrifices, we're not going to do it. In green marketing, the future is a world where we can have it both ways, where feel-good green ads depict man and nature once more in balance. The consumer of today is in a state of tension between wanting one thing, which is sustainable lifestyle, environmental responsibility, and on the other side, they're also looking to have new exciting technologies, um, still buy lots of stuff and, and want the best for their, for their families and for themselves. The marketers may be telling us what we want to hear, but deep down we know the time has arrived for some planetary payback. A lot of people believe that these kinds of disastrous outcomes are real, that you know, we may well see the collapse of the grid, the collapse of the oil economy, global crisis around the environment. And at the same time, we still have this little attraction to thinking about how the world could fall apart. It's as if the threat of apocalypse is becoming an inevitability. 
the sense that the world is ending and we deserve it. Whether it's because we've made bad environmental choices, bad political choices, whatever the rationale is. If only we had been better people, then we wouldn't be facing this fate. But we weren't, so it's, it's our fault. It's our fault, we deserve it. Pessimism is the new black. And unfortunately, pessimism works against what we need, which is long-term thinking. In times of crisis, the person who thinks longest wins. Panic is not a strategy. Our survival depends on our ability to remake our relationship to the world we live in. But how will we do it? The answer may already be here. In the past decade, computers have transformed our lives. They are ever smaller, ever faster, and ever smarter. The power of supercomputers is now found on our desktops and in our pockets. Computers are pervasive and ubiquitous in our world, and they are disappearing into the fabric of our existence. The better we understand computers, the more they fade into the background, to the point where a computer may become an obsolete word in the latter half of the 21st century, an archaic word uh, that, that we no longer use. In the near future, the digital and physical worlds will converge, and the planet itself will function as a computer interface. More than any other element of the future, the spread of pervasive computing will define the lives of coming generations. It may also help us rescue the world. The San Jacinto Mountains in Southern California may look idyllic, but this pastoral landscape is on the front lines of the battle to save the planet. Mike Taggart is a scientist and engineer spearheading an initiative to closely monitor the health of this ecosystem in real time. His team is using an array of miniature sensors, cameras, and recording devices that are creating the most detailed portrait of a forest environment ever produced. All of these sensors and, and also sensors below ground for CO2, nitrogen, temperature, and uh, soil moisture are, uh, are placed underground. And all of these sensors all come up into these boxes, which go to the data loggers, which then are networked to our servers back at the lab. Located throughout the forest, the sensors are monitoring an unprecedented number of parameters. From the life cycles of moss to the carbon dioxide uptake of various types of soil and the acoustical data generated by bird songs. These pervasive sensor webs are part of a global push to finally give people the immediate information about our planet that we have always lacked. The frontier for these scientists is the ever-shrinking scale of observation, even down to the level of individual birds, insects, and plants. We are continually accelerating with the amount of data that we're able to gather. We've created detectors that are able to extract huge amounts of data, and it means that we can study lots of phenomena in much, much more detail uh, and with much greater depth of understanding than we possibly had before. A lot of people, they don't expect to see cameras in nature. They're walking through the forest and all of a sudden they stumble upon a bunch of antennas or a box or a solar panel. From a human perspective, yeah, that's kind of strange to see that in the wilderness setting. But on the other hand, the animals don't really care. They don't know it's technology. This is a powerful tool for more than one reason. First of all, it does give us information about the actual state of the ecology. But secondly, it also brings the natural world into the human world. The images that we get from bird boxes, uh, the data we get from sensors, I think especially for the kids in school, I think being able to see in real time, this is the life of a bird. We catch that whole life cycle on, on the camera and it's available for anybody to see. So one would hope that it, it makes people more aware of the planet and their surroundings.
as our information technologies become more complex, and more importantly, as our ability to interact with these systems becomes more nuanced, then our capacity to understand the world becomes more powerful and ideally allows us to make better choices, new choices that we simply couldn't have made before. It took a trip to the moon for us to finally see the big picture of our planet. Now, the sensor webs are giving us another opportunity to truly understand the world and our place in it. It's one thing to measure things from a satellite. You can look down and you can say, this, this 100 square acres is this temperature. But is it really? Is it really that over that whole entire range? By taking our sensors and doing things on a much smaller scale, I think it allows us to do better modeling in the long run. So I think we're helping to be able to make better guesses about the direction things are headed. Digital technology is allowing us to create a living map of the world. In the next few decades, computer networks will be found everywhere. They will even be in our own bodies. Our homes, our children, the products we buy, even the medications we take will all be networked into an intelligent global web. Our ability to access and share this information may allow us to live more consciously on the planet and provide us with a revolutionary new way of solving global problems. It's fundamentally important to recognize that intelligence is not a solitary process. It's not something that just happens in individual brains. Intelligence is a social process. Our network connections and all of these technologies give us the capacity to think better, think faster. And the more that we have the capacity to think together and co-create, the more powerful we become. The hope is this web of information will create a world and a way of life that lasts. In 2010, the total amount of data generated worldwide will reach a staggering 400 billion gigabytes. Some believe that the task of organizing this into useful knowledge is beyond the scope of human intelligence. IBM's Almaden Research Center is ground zero for the development of cognitive computing. The idea is to reverse engineer the human brain in order to create a new kind of supercomputer. What the cognitive computer people are looking to do is create in digital technology a structural replication of the extraordinarily dense interconnections of a biological brain. One of the hallmark features of a biological brain is the richness of interaction between the different neurons. This dream is led by project research head Dharmendra Moda. Goal of cognitive computing is to discover, demonstrate, and deliver the algorithm of the brain. This is the holy grail. The cognitive computer will be a global network that helps us interpret and respond to the massive amounts of data about the biosphere that a totally wired world will generate. Despite the limitations of human behavior, mimicking the cognitive processes of the human brain may give us our best shot at survival in the 21st century. The cognitive computing scientists know that the human brain can do things that standard computers can't, around pattern recognition, around intuition, around creativity. What you can do with something like a cognitive computing system is look for ways to make them work better. The human eye takes in few million sensors every millisecond. This is a tsunami of data coming at the brain. Even the most powerful computers or the smartest algorithms of the day cannot aim to parallel the awesome capabilities of the human mind and the brain. It's that interaction between the human brain and these kinds of cognitive computing systems that allow us to understand more than we could before. To give humans as individuals and as a society 
the ability to understand things that we simply couldn't understand alone. Solving the mystery of human consciousness is just the beginning. Moda's global brain could lead to a world where humans and technology pursue the same goal, finding a way to live sustainably on the planet. Like all future visions, the dreams of Dr. Moda are subject to the winds of change. We are torn between optimism and apocalypse, and the question is, now what? We don't yet know if our technology will finally let us create a future that is sustainable. We human beings have long had the capacity to use technology to enhance our knowledge and increase our wisdom. My hope, and I won't categorize it as a forecast or a prediction, but a hope, is that we manage to improve our ability to make changes to ourselves, improve our capacity to adapt fast enough to be able to respond to the increasingly complex challenges that we see are happening. In the end, the goal of the extraordinary technologies we are creating may be quite simple. To do the right thing for those yet to come. What I try and do is get people to understand the advice of my friend Stuart Brand, who said, the task for us alive today is to learn how to become good ancestors, to do those things that will put us on a trajectory that will benefit generations unborn.